back. Kind of scoot it along. Getting the simulator to the point where it was starting to talk to motors, it involved a bunch of distractions along the way. Anytime I came across some code where I, I kind of couldn't really see at all what it was doing, it was especially interesting to me. Oh, it's kind of shaped like this, it's accessing these registers. I can kind of see, you know, whether it's interesting or not. There are like 800 USB cables here. Teach the simulator how to run it really quickly so that I don't have to personally think about it. Just from looking at the board, this is about all we can tell. This big chip is the MT1939 system on a chip by MediaTek. Um, it's got an ARM logo on it, so we know it has an ARM CPU, but it's about all you can tell by looking at it. There's no public data sheet. And then two small chips by TI that collectively do all of the motor control tasks. And then a power converter from ST. MT1939 chip. What do we know about it? Definitely a USB core. There's some flash memory because we've seen the firmware for it. And we know there's an ARM CPU. There's some kind of bus that connects the ARM and the flash memory. I know that there is an 8051 CPU somewhere. I was originally assuming that the 8051 was connected to the USB interface and then the 8051 connected to the ARM using some kind of flexible connection channel so that maybe this whole thing could be replaced by some other interface that knows a different protocol like SATA. My immediate goal is really just to run this firmware in simulation. That seems good. The GoPro's going. I think that was the startup sequence it goes through. Oh, there we go. You can see the lasers go. So now I should be able to connect to it over SCSI. And up here you can see the USB transactions going on. Let's do BitBang. So I'll enter BitBang mode, and this kind of hijacks the ARM CPU and gives us complete control over the device, but now we're talking to it through this really slow serial port. Pretty soon I'm going to want to write my own firmware for this from scratch. It'll need to talk to the outside world. So I've been keeping a close eye on how the USB communication works. You know, I started out just looking for things that I would recognize in the firmware, you know, numbers or control structures that might hint at USB. And then I found some stuff like that in this 8051 firmware. And, you know, it turns out the 8051 doesn't have a complete USB driver in it. I saw this code on the 8051 that seemed to be talking very directly to the USB controller in order to send replies back to the computer. When you first plug in a USB device, there are a bunch of standard commands your computer will send it asking it to identify itself. I expected that if the 8051 processor was handling all the USB communications, you know, that it would have the code necessary to respond to these commands from your computer. USB descriptors are things like the name of the device, the manufacturer, what driver to load, what kinds of input and output pipes it has. That data is all formatted in a very specific way, and it's usually pretty easy to find in a firmware image. I didn't find that data in the 8051 firmware. I found that data in the ARM firmware. I thought that the ARM processor was taking those USB descriptors and kind of packaging them up and putting them in shared memory into a place where the 8051 could access them. I didn't really find evidence to support that. I think the role of the 8051 processor is actually much stranger. I can see the main ARM processor actually initializing the USB controller, actually doing all of the work in responding to those USB descriptor requests. There's a 16-bit address space connected directly to the 8051 processor, a bus which, among other things, happens to have the USB controller on it. The ARM processor has access to that same bus, but via kind of this intermediation layer, this protocol where you kind of ask for access, do a handshake. Like the bus kind of belongs to the 8051. The ARM has the ability to kind of like ask nicely and get access to it. The ARM processor initially uses that bus to install firmware on the 8051, but then you can actually see it using that bus both to communicate with the 8051 firmware and kind of pass messages and to just talk to the USB controller directly. The ARM processor seems to directly get interrupts for the USB controller. So this is, this is actually really encouraging and also really baffling. It means that the custom firmware I write for this chip could actually be a lot simpler than I thought. Like, maybe I don't even need to write 8051 firmware, maybe I can just turn off the 8051. There's probably a good reason they have the 8051, and I'll probably discover that later. I have some hunches, timing sensitive operations, to still be able to respond back to the computer even when the ARM processor is very busy. Maybe it's just vestigial, maybe it used to be a separate component. It's really hard to tell at this point. I've started to map out the 8051 register space. There's some stuff down here that seems to be SCSI and, or seems to be other things that are used for communications between the ARM and the 8051. In trying to map out the memory for the 8051, 
I ended up using kind of a different process than I did for the ARM. The 8051 just has so little memory. The CPU itself, I think, has 128 bytes of RAM, and then I found another 384 bytes of kind of more external RAM. With the 8051, it becomes much more of an issue of just kind of editing text files and doing things by hand because the scale of everything is just so small. When I did this on the ARM, there was just so much more going on. I needed a better way of visualizing that. This XKCD was actually really inspiring. He's come up with a way of mapping out all of the IPv4 addresses in the internet by taking that giant 32-bit address space and folding it into a space-filling curve that fits into a square, and he chose a Hilbert curve. And the cool thing about this is, you know, you even though you lose the property that it kind of reads left to right, top to bottom, now you have this property that things that are nearby in the address space are nearby in the image. So this is a... Uh, what I've called a mem square for all of the address space on the ARM processor. This region down here is DRAM. This is the entire 32-bit address space on the ARM, going all the way from 0 to FFFFFF. Since this is surveying all the address space, it's pretty coarse resolution. Each pixel here is 256 bytes. This whole square here is 64 megabytes. Different information is mapped into each color channel. Red has the average value of each block. Green has the variance. Taken together, they can give you a lot more information about the composition of these memory blocks than, uh, than either individual plane. The blue channel is a logarithmically scaled representation of the memory access time. This is a higher resolution mem square. This is about four megabytes of RAM. This is mostly the buffer memory that the chip uses. And this kind of weird square pattern is what happens when you have uninitialized DRAM. This kind of like static pattern. The static is a little bit different depending on kind of how much electrical noise was in that part of the chip. The physical distribution of those charges don't really map directly to the addresses. So these kind of tell you how the chip is arranged a little bit. Average value of all the blocks and then the variance, like how much those are changing. And then access times for all the regions here that are mapped. Um, and the mapping region is a little bit weird. You can see that it isn't quite mapped on even boundaries. And this is, this is actually correct, like it's, this is, there's like a 32k chunk that it's kind of offset by. It's a little bit weird. So I think that's all I'm going to say about MemSquare. Right now I'm connected to this over USB using the kind of backdoor commands that I patched into the firmware. So I've added a new command line option to this bitbang command it installs an additional debug stub for the 8051 processor. So here it's already switched to the Bitbang interface. Now it's sending a little package of data. That package contains the 8051 firmware itself and a uh, small library of ARM functions that I can call. The 8051 and the ARM can just use this one little byte of shared memory to kind of send data back and forth. And then just like I did over the serial port, I have a little debug stub that just sits there waiting for commands. I can do things like uh, read 8051 memory. And this is an example of some of the 8051's memory mapped I.O. space. L-O-C is the prefix on the block read SCSI command that the backdoor was using. This line is actually the last SCSI packet that the 8051 processed before I reset it. The firmware is really small, it's just this one C function. It uses just a couple of the registers that I found on the 8051. There's one that I know is shared with the ARM processor and it appears to be designed for general purpose communications like this. You know, Ford B00 is another I.O. area. This is just some unmapped memory. This 8000 area appears to be some RAM. When I started trying to figure out how the ARM and the 8051 talk to each other, I would start to find these repeating patterns in the register accesses in the simulator. You could just wait for it and kind of let it go. If you can replace the very repetitive operations with something... something higher level and more concise, this helps a lot with understanding. So when I found something that either I understood or that I wanted to figure out how to generalize, kind of try to wrap it up into a little C function, kind of hack on separately. And then once I had a C function that worked, I could add logging to it. Firmware install and the firmware checksum. So the shared memory bus with the 8051 has these accessor routines, and it helped a lot to use these high-level emulation hooks to replace the simulated accessor routines with C++ accessors. With the benefit of all this higher-level tracing output, it becomes much clearer what the 8051 registers do and how they're being used for communications. Okay, so the 8051. I, I know enough about the 8051 to know that I can put it aside for a little while. The first thing the simulator hit that I couldn't run was this encrypted function. Go, go, gadget, Ida. So in order to get the firmware to run in the simulator long enough for it to actually start moving motors and doing that kind of thing, I hit these three kind of big distractions or challenges um, along the way. The first thing that got in the way was actually an encrypted function, very near the beginning of the firmware image. Address 11,000 hex. 
and they start out with this very suspicious looking sequence. There's one instruction up here, this MSR. In this case, this instruction is actually ensuring that the processor has interrupts disabled and that it's in supervisor mode. You know, if either of those conditions weren't true before this instruction runs, you're guaranteed that it's true after. And then there's a bunch of no ops. This just does nothing. I can think of some reasons why this might be necessary. It wasn't really completely clear that it was an encrypted function, but there were some giveaways. By context, in simulation, I can see that this function is being called, and it starts with some code that is valid, but kind of weird. Then it just continues on into some stuff which looks pretty much random. Near the end of the encrypted function, there's actually a region where every 16 bytes actually repeats. So this is actually a giveaway that they're using a particular kind of encryption um, called ECB mode or electronic code book. Every 16 bytes of code, every 128 bits, like a word in a code language, then you would take that word and look it up in a dictionary and find another word substituted in. Usually impractical to figure out the entire dictionary. Because you know that that substitution always happens the same way, this kind of encryption is actually pretty bad because it gives away a lot of information about your data that you don't really need to give away. It's really fast, even if you have random access. I would expect that this encryption happens every time a line of 16 bytes is fetched out of memory into the processor's cache. And this section at the bottom probably had a padding byte to indicate that this section of memory isn't used. Encrypted through this electronic codebook, it always ends up as the same ciphertext. So just by seeing that the encrypted values are the same, you can tell that the unencrypted values are the same. And so you can tell not only what kind of encryption they're using, but roughly how big the encrypted function is, just by looking at the encrypted code. Depending on the operation, they actually invoke one of three different encrypted functions. The one on the right is 11,000, the one that I needed to figure out because it happens very soon after boot. Here it's putting some pointers into memory mapped I.O. registers. Then after programming those memory addresses into the hardware, it just jumps into the function, just like it would normally make a function call. After making that call, the processor enters this sequence where we make sure we're in supervisor mode, and then there's this weird sequence of no-ops. It's actually programming pointers into those memory mapped I.O. registers, specifically demarcating this region of memory, just the encrypted part of the function. So it's telling the hardware, you know, when you get to this point in memory, think about decrypting it. This is actually something you see a lot in video game consoles or in other hardware where they're intentionally trying to protect it from some kind of tampering. In the case with video game hardware, the whole system is just oozing with DRM. They want to make it impossible to produce games without paying them licensing fees. And now there's this encrypted function. So I figured this might have to do with preserving a chain of trust, some way that, you know, later on after the system is booted up, some piece of code probably related to DRM, you know, Blu-ray video decryption, you know, it's probably some of that nonsense. I would expect them to have some chain of trust where that little encrypted bootloader sets up crypto parameters in the hardware that would be necessary in order to have the hardware transparently decrypt these functions. I didn't really want to bother with figuring out how to set up the crypto hardware. I really just wanted to figure out what these functions do so that I know if they're important or not. If I can decrypt these once and then look inside enough to figure out whether they're interesting or not. I took some notes on some of the experiments I did to try to figure out the cryptography. Right now it looks just like we had it in IDA. I wrote a C++ function that only knows how to do that one kind of encrypted function operation that I see right after boot. You know, some kind of setup operation. It runs and then just returns a value. And the important thing here isn't the value itself, because I have no idea what this is doing at this point, but it's just that it runs and it doesn't crash and it returns. This tells me that I can get in and then out. If I was just running the encrypted code um, as I see it in the simulator, it would definitely crash because the processor just hits these instructions that are apparently garbage. But this tells me that something really fishy is happening and there's some kind of automatic decryption happening in the hardware. So I did some more experimenting with these registers. That initial sequence with the MSR instruction and all the no-ops, it looks like an unlock sequence. Like they have some special hardware unit that does cryptography, but in order to just make extra sure that it doesn't decrypt stuff by accident or decrypt stuff without being set up properly, or maybe it has to do with making sure that the instruction cache is clear, for whatever reason, they have some hardware in there that only enables the decryption if it sees this specific sequence of instructions. 
So, so that's pretty interesting. They've got this kind of unlock mechanism. Code is never really just instructions. Code always has data built into it. Instructions often have to have other data nearby that they have to reference just as part of their normal course of operation. I found a way to exploit that to get these functions to read themselves. It turns out this was actually pretty easy. I've been using this hardware feature to patch flash memory for investigative purposes. I can write some code or a breakpoint instruction into this little piece of RAM and then move that piece of RAM anywhere I want and put it sort of over top of the flash memory. So I was curious how this interacted with their transparent decryption. There's gotta be some kind of ordering. Either the decryption happens before or after that memory overlay. Turns out that the, the decryption happens first and then the memory overlay happens afterwards. So if I do that overlay, I'm actually overlaying onto the plain text, onto the decrypted code, not onto the encrypted code. And, you know, either way, I could probably use this to get in. Like, if there's any kind of way I can modify that code using the overlay, I think I could use that to get into the system. But this is much easier, because now I can just take plain text, you know, unencrypted ARM instructions, and just patch those in. And I don't know what the code I'm overwriting is, but if I patch code in near the beginning, then I can at least read the rest of the code. I can write a patch into the very beginning of the encrypted portion of that function, loads an address, in this case, this um, 11100, and then reads one word from that address and returns it. We can use this as a probe to see if we are successfully reading unencrypted code. First, I'll just read that same address through the debugger. That whole area around 11100 looks like random garbage, and this first word um, shows up here. It's this 12BE, etc., and doesn't really seem to mean much. This actually returns the word I'm interested in in R0, which is the return value for a C++ function. Now when I run it, I get a value which is different from what I saw in the unpatched function. It doesn't crash, and it also doesn't return the same value the debugger returns. This returns something that looks a lot less encrypted. You know, it has a lot of zeros in it. It's a smaller number. And it's unlikely that you'd see a number like this just kind of randomly in encrypted code. So this probe that I insert obscures eight bytes of the original function. Aside from that limitation, I can now read out the entire plain text of this encrypted function. So this is a simple loop in Python for every word of memory. It'll assemble a little program, smallest way to just read one word of memory and then return, just invokes the firmware's own function that runs these encrypted routines. And then it returns with that word we asked for. So this is a much better memory dump. This one starts with the no ops and the MSR, and then it goes into ARM code. All right, so here is the inside. These are, these are some instructions that somebody was trying to keep secret. These instructions here are actually the probe that we were using to read data out. Start in the middle of the first thumb function because the very beginning was cut off. And we've got a substantial amount of code here. This isn't just sort of one routine. That subroutine was some kind of entry point to, you know, kind of a larger subsystem. This does have some code that talks to hardware. These addresses here, this 406 region, this is hardware. When I first started investigating this function at 11,000, I, I had no idea what it did. It seemed like this function might be part of setting up some kind of DSP interface. It might be part of how some of the hardware is initialized. So there we go. After I saw this, I knew I really didn't have to go any farther. AACS is the Advanced Access Content System, I think. The DRM system they use for content protection on some Blu-ray discs. DRM, you know, it never works. You give people a disc and you want them to be able to play it, but you want playing it to be really, really obscure so that people have to ask you how to play it. And eventually people are going to figure it out. So this AACS system has long been broken in multiple ways, but we still have to deal with it in the code. I'm hoping that the manufacturer kept the DRM stuff separate enough from the parts that I actually need to run the system so that I don't have to reverse engineer the DRM because neither of us really want that. I think what's going on is that this is some sort of boot up initialization for a library that handles this AACS decryption. I've tried just stubbing this out, replacing that entire encrypted function with something that just returns zero. So far that seems to work. Problem number one worked around. I don't have to deal with these encrypted functions. I can just stub them out and it seems like they're only for DRM. Then I also originally thought there was another kind of DSP block over here that would connect to the same bus. Now I reach this section of code that's just taking forever. It's hard to tell if it's even working. Now I'm letting this thing run, but I'm also trying to figure out what it's doing. I was under the assumption that this function was related to installing DSP firmware. It took two parameters, and the first one was a pointer to this region of code, which I couldn't really make sense of from the hex dump, but it looked like it might be instructions for some processor I didn't recognize. 
There are actually a couple of these that I referred to as kind of DSP firmware before. That's kind of all that made sense at the time. This thing has a slow ARM processor, two MIPS executing code from DRAM. I expected that they would have another CPU, probably a DSP core, that would actually handle the kind of data encoding and decoding and all of that. They had different firmwares for different kinds of disks, you know, maybe one of them is for DVD and one of them is for Blu-ray, and I figured that was how it accesses the, you know, the motors and the fancy laser control hardware. I figured all of that hardware would be on the DSP because the DSP would need direct access to it, and that I would really need to get inside the DSP via this firmware upload. So I had this function that seemed to take as input a DSP firmware as one parameter, and then, and then an address in DRAM, I noticed ARM code in RAM was being put there by this function. That was suspicious, you know, this was generating ARM code on the fly to talk to the DSP, maybe it was like a library, and that seemed kind of far-fetched. It seemed a lot more likely that maybe this was just decompressing ARM code. Like maybe there was too much ARM code to fit in flash memory uncompressed, so they take all of the stuff that they can get away with swapping out, the disk type specific stuff maybe, put that into this compressed little package. The decompression still takes a couple of seconds, even on real hardware, but you don't usually notice this because I think they do it while the disk is spinning up. This is the actual firmware decompression function. And I haven't bothered to completely untangle this thing because, you know, Data compression is complicated and I don't really care that much. I did actually trace the inputs and outputs enough that I can see where it's writing the decompressed code. And these are two output paths. You know, likely one of them goes through like a dictionary table and one of them is through for literals. It's reading some data tables from the beginning of the compressed firmware, presumably to initialize a decompression state machine. Maybe these are like Huffman tables or, you know, frequency tables, that kind of thing. Up here, this uh, little blue region, so blue on this diagram is code. Brownish stuff is like kind of uninitialized or kind of undeclared data. Down here, this is flash memory. And then up here is one of the decompressed images. There's a lot of code here and it's doing a bunch of things. This, I was really surprised to find these. So inside the decompressed firmware, these are actually double precision floating point constants. In this C code that's running on a pretty slow 32-bit no floating point processor, these have got to be parameters for a DSP. No, no, they've got a software floating point library. FP double multiply. I, I don't even know what to say about this. Like, it just must not be at all important how fast this stuff goes, or this ARM processor has a way of running way faster than I think it can go. And now, I don't think there's actually a DSP at all. There might just be little hardware modules sort of all over the place. Motor control. And lasers. Everybody likes lasers. So normally I would load the simulation from like a saved state. The compressed firmware takes like 38 million clock cycles to decompress. My simulator is slow. I could make my simulator faster, but I could also just add a way to save and restore state. So that's what I did. I'm just gonna reset the simulator. It's sending a block of high-level emulation routines, and these are so that I can say, you know, at this point in the code, I want to replace that with a chunk of C++ code and run that instead. I can use that high-level emulation to run experiments and kind of try to replace the low-level existing firmware with higher and higher level bits of my own code as I grow more of an understanding of the system. So the high-level emulation stubs are installed, and so now I could single step. I'm just going to run continuously. I found some functions that crash because they expected the clock to advance at a particular rate, and so I tried patching those in various ways. This firmware decompression is really slow. Now that the USB controller is initialized, the computer is kind of trying to talk to it, trying to say, hi, you know, I see there's a device there, what are you? The device just isn't listening or isn't responding fast enough. It's over 36 million clock cycles later, and we've reached the main loop. So I sort of jury-rigged their main loop and interrupt handlers into kind of a round-robin main loop so that it kind of pulls all the hardware to see if anything needs to be done. You should be able to see it um, interacting with some of the hardware. I have it generating these commands just ready to be pasted right into the shell when it writes to hardware registers. And so now it's interacting a lot with these registers in this 4206 space which I'm pretty sure is the stepper motor controller, or possibly a more generic motor controller. Time for plenty of coffee breaks while the simulator runs, but I have a feeling it's about to get exciting.
And it does seem to write to these 4206 registers quite a lot before anything happens with the hardware. It's not like I can find a bit that's just like, you know, step, one step. It's, it's higher level than that. Um, and it's not even like, oh. <laughs> Um, yeah, so it just suddenly draws half an amp, makes a terrible noise, and, um, and then stops making a terrible noise, and then goes on with things. It's oftentimes actually hard to tell even if it's hung or not, just because the process is so slow. Even if the simulator was as fast as the real thing, this this is basically a 56k modem that I'm doing all my I.O. over. Because, you know, it's just kind of going into these sequences where you don't really see it doing much except kind of repetitively banging on this one register. You run the simulator, you know, it either crashes or it'll just kind of keep running and you're not really sure if it's working or not. If you got everything right, if the ARM simulator was flawless and if you aren't going to hit any kind of, you know, hidden gotchas in the hardware, maybe you come back, you know, that afternoon and you've got some output that you can make sense of. I think the next thing it would do is to try to like move the lenses and focus them, but I haven't actually seen it turn on the laser in this mode yet. You know, things never go perfectly the first time and so I think a lot of what this has been is kind of learning how to fail quickly. You know, right now I've just kind of opened up this whole new thing. You know, I've got this simulator that's finally working well enough to talk to the real hardware and I've, I've seen, you know, the hardware actually move and interact. Now there's just like a wealth of things to work on and things to open up. So it's it's really exciting now. This is a really, really cool time in the project. Feels like I'm kind of getting past all those barriers. I have high level tools that operate on that code, which has direct hardware access. So now I can, you know, make a lot of progress quickly, hopefully, um, and really get a sense for what all these registers do. It's at the point where the hardware is pretty well initialized and the motor controller is turned on. Oh, kitty, you're back. What's up? So here I've got a file with a bunch of the register writes extracted from that simulation log. And if I just copy and paste these into the shell here, then a whole bunch of things happen. The motor moves one way, and then it moves the other way. I kind of continued to cut that down to just try to figure out what registers actually made the thing move. Kind of a minimal sequence of these five register writes that just kind of moves it a little bit. And I can just repeatedly issue those as many as I want. I can, and I can kind of move the head back. You know, if this was kind of a typical stepper controller like you might find on Arduino Shield or something, you'd have like a step pin, you'd have a direction pin, you'd write code that kind of times out your steps and kind of toggles the step pin. And I don't see any of that, you know, it just moved. You know, that was like almost a centimeter. This is a really high resolution stepper motor, so that was a bunch of steps. I don't really see anything in here that even seems to indicate like a number of steps. So I think what I'm actually just telling this to do is to take the last motor movement that it was programmed to do and just execute that again. There's going to be a lot more work in terms of figuring out what all these registers do and mapping out, you know, how do I, how do I program the motor controller to make a particular motion? Because um, I think that's the kind of level of control we're dealing with. But at this point, I can at least kind of, you know, do these replays and take stuff that I've seen the firmware do and kind of do it again. And that gives me a sense of what the registers do and I can make a lot more sense out of these giant log files this way. So at this point, I'm inside the ARM, I'm inside the 8051, I'm inside the flash memory. I know kind of where to start with the USB controller. There's a lot that I can reverse engineer now. <laughs> Thanks for watching everybody. See you next time. All this code's in GitHub so you can get your own drive and hack along. <laughs>